about Colossians. Paul commands under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. I love that adverb, God. Let the word dwell in you richly. Let it go down into the deepest fibers of your being and permeate your being so that, Lord, our minds become Bible-saturated minds. Your word is true. It is a perfect treasure. That's what we see again in Psalm 19. So would you grant, Lord, that as David celebrated the gift of your word, we would have in our hearts, God, today a sense of thanksgiving to you for the gift of your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, Psalm 19. We started last week with the intent of finishing, but that was probably presumptuous and foolish. So we will uh, review it in a second, but keep your finger there. And I mentioned this last week, but if you have an English standard version of the Bible, go look at the um, they call it the preface. I, I couldn't remember if it was called a foreword or a preface. It's called the preface right at the start of the Bible. And mine, it's on page VII, <laughs> okay, page seven. And uh, so the, the preface, and it's always fun to read these and helpful to read these. This is a note from the, the people who trans the scholars who translated this English version of the Bible. And uh, they'll talk about their translation theory and why they made certain choices in Hebrew and in Greek. But this one begins this way. You see the quote, this book is the most valuable thing that this world affords. Here is wisdom. And notice with the capital W, this is the royal law. Notice the capital L. These are the lively oracles of God. With these words, the moderator of the Church of Scotland hands a Bible to the new monarch in Britain's coronation service. These words echo the King James Bible translators who wrote in 1611, God's sacred word is that inestimable treasure that excelleth all the riches of the earth. Isn't that a wonderful sentence? Okay. God's sacred word is that inestimable treasure that excelleth all the riches of the earth. This assessment of the Bible is the motivating force behind the publication of the English Standard Version. Now that's the spirit of Psalm 19. We saw last week that Psalm 19 is not a formal theological treatise. That wasn't what the Holy Spirit inspired David to write, but, but David is reflecting under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit on number one, which we talked about last week in verses one through six, God's revelation of himself through nature, through the natural world. Paul in Romans 1 picks up what David here says. It says that nature itself, the creation, reveals us God's divine nature, that God is there and that he is, uh, at least it reveals in part, he is the God who he is. But then David moves on from verses 7 to 11 to think about God's revelation of himself through his word. We know a little bit about God from nature, a little bit. But we would not know the gospel. And we would not know how to live lives that please God. And we would not know 10,000 other realities apart from the written word of God. Does it ever strike you that God chose to leave us a book? He didn't choose to leave us a video. He chose to leave us a book. That's deliberate. He wants us to read and to think about this word. Okay? And David thought this word was a 
great treasure. And you'll see that in the verses that we'll read today. We'll look at verses 7 through 11, where he says the Bible is this, and because it's this, it does this. Okay, that's David's logic. And then there's a response in verses 12 through 14 in two prayers that David offers up. But let's read together to get the context, the whole psalm. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their measuring line goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Thanks be to God for his word. Let's look together at it, beginning again in verse 7. Last week, verses 1 through 6, God has revealed himself through nature. But God has revealed himself much more clearly. We would not know the gospel. We would not know how to live lives pleasing to God, apart from God's written word to us. Think about it. Is it one of your favorite passages in the Bible, Jesus with his two disciples on the road to Emmaus, the morning of his resurrection, they're kept supernaturally from recognizing who he is, and he spends the whole walk, I think it's about seven miles, he spends the whole walk going from Genesis to Malachi, unfolding in the Old Testament everything there is about him. Now, that's one video I wish the Lord had preserved for us. He did not see, now, he didn't do, why didn't he see fit to do that? Anybody want to ask? I have a guess. I mean, I don't know the Lord's name, but I have a good guess. Why didn't the Lord preserve that conversation for us? He preserved so much else in the gospel. He didn't preserve that. Oh, uh, perhaps so that we ourselves might dig into God's work. That is exactly it, Jim. So that we would do that. Okay, so that we would go through the Old Testament and see everything in there that reveals Christ. Okay. Um, all right, verse, let's begin in, um, in verse seven. Now, in formal theology, and I'm about to teach that. So we just started the school year. If um, uh, Pastor Steve seems maybe a little tired today, <laughs> he is a little tired today. So the school week started on Monday. Uh, as Jim mentioned, on Wednesday, my mother-in-law died. Her funeral, she did know the Lord. She was 90, but she knew the Lord well. And so uh, two weeks from today, we'll celebrate 
her relationship with Christ at her funeral, uh, which will be in Atlanta. But um, Thursday, we took our son, our young, our youngest child, our son, John, down to the University of Illinois and put him in school and drove that long drive back. <laughs> so, you know, now the empty nest and <laughs> we already miss him. So he's, he's, there's six years between him and his next sister. So uh, he's been the only child in the home for, well, mostly the only child in the home for the last six years. Mm -hmm. So we just, you know, we love him to pieces and we miss him, but uh, this is the Lord's will and the Lord's helping him. He's going to be some of, who went to the U of I in here? Uh, Jim did, it's a couple of, you know, the TCBC, Twin Cities Bible Church. Uh, that's, he's, he's going to walk from his dorm all the way across campus to, TCBC for church today. He promised to call his mom on the way to church as he was walking to church. So he's going to a campus crusade event tonight. So he's, he's uh, I think, got off to a good start by the Lord's grace. But then Friday and yesterday, the school where I teach, our upper school has an annual retreat the first weekend of school. So we were at Lake Geneva Youth Camp which is an old Christian camp on the old Christian camp. Needs a coat of paint really badly. <laughs> but I mean, it is in Lake Geneva, right? Okay. Sort of doesn't belong, but it's in Lake Geneva. There it is. And um, the price is right. If you ever want a, a retreat or something, it's Lake Geneva Youth Camp and Conference Center. Okay. I mean, the accommodations are... It, not no air conditioning, you know. I mean, it's it's a little bit Spartan, but it's yeah, yeah. The, the price is right, <laughs> and it's in Lake Geneva. <laughs> so where else is the price right in Lake Geneva? Um, but we uh, had a great time. We went through Colossians three over the two days together in four different chapel services, but. Since uh, Pastor Steve is the interim principal for the upper school, guess who was in charge of the retreat? <laughs> so if it's, he seems a little draggy and maybe a little bit slow on the uptake, as they say, <laughs> just forgive me, okay? Have, have grace, <laughs> have grace. Um, in any event, I'm about to begin in my, uh, I teach juniors systematic theology. And systematic theology is simply Christian doctrine presented straight from the scriptures. They bring their Bibles. We're in the Bible every day. But it's, it's our teaching from the scriptures that's presented in a systematic way. And we begin the year with the doctrine of scripture. And we will begin to talk about tomorrow the five characteristics of scripture. You might want to jot these down. You probably know uh, most or all of them already, okay? But the five characteristics of, of scripture. Again, I am not claiming that David here writes a formal theological treatise. That's not what it is. It's a reflection on the word of God. But in the process, he praises God for most, if not all, of these characteristics of Scripture. So here they are. Number one, and most importantly, the authority of Scripture. This was what was so important to the Protestant reformers. I love the definition I've inherited uh, of the authority of Scripture. The authority of Scripture means that to disobey or to disbelieve, or, or the authority of Scripture means that, excuse me, the Bible is God's word in such a way that the Bible is God's word in such a way that to disbelieve or disobey the Bible is to disbelieve or disobey God. Okay, that's a good definition of the authority of God. Doesn't say everything, but it's a good definition. Then, second characteristic inerrancy. The Bible is without. Error. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. Okay. Number three, the clarity of scripture. If two important 
supposition, presuppositions. If you come to the Bible willing to be taught by it and willing to do what it says, okay, so if you come with a mind that is teachable, a spirit that's teachable, and a will that says, I'm here to find out what God wants me to do, you will find that the Bible is clear. That, that doesn't mean there aren't questions and that there aren't hard passages, but it means that it, overall, the Bible will be clear to you. Some of you have had the experience when you were not yet a believer, you would read the Bible and it seemed to you like reading a calculus book. Now, some of you can read calculus books. I, I took a, I took calculus. <laughs> I took a lot of calculus, actually. But my students show me their calculus book, and I think, did I ever do this? I mean, this looks like some language that I've never even seen before. I mean, this is like Sumerian or Akkadian, you know, some language. Good gracious. And for some of you, the Bible was like that. But when you became a Christian, as your heart was submissive to the Bible and submissive to the will of God, it becomes more clear. And it becomes more clear the more that you read it through the years. Okay, So the authority of the Bible, the inerrancy of the Bible, the clarity of the Bible, the sufficiency of the Bible. Right? The Bible is sufficient to train the person of God, the man of God, for every good work. Is, has God told us everything we would like to know in the Bible? No. Has God told us everything we need to know in the Bible? Yes. Okay. Yes, he has. Okay. We, we know the gospel. We know how to live in a way that pleases God because the Bible is sufficient. And then... Last, it's necessary. Romans 10. No one's going to be a saved apart from the proclamation from hearing the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Well, what the, what's the word of God? The word of God we speak is simply a synopsis of the word of God written. That's where the word of God starts, the word of God written. So those five characteristics of scripture are reflected more or less in what David writes. But let's look at it. Verses 7 through 9 are set up this way. God's word is X, and so it does Y. God's word is X, adjective, and so it does Y in our lives. And we started this last Sunday, but let's look at it again. Before we do, Notice verse 7, the law of the Lord. Second part of verse 7, the testimony of the Lord. 8, the precepts of the Lord. Second part of verse 8, the commandment of the Lord. Uh, the end of verse 9, the rules of the Lord. So we said David uses all these different terms. This, and if you've studied Psalm 119, you know that's characteristic of Psalm 119 as well. It's a variety of terms for the word of God. And each has a slightly different shade of meaning. Now, we don't have enough time to go into the details today, but suffice it to say, David's not just talking about a portion of the scriptures. He's talking about all the scriptures, at least the ones, of course, he had in his day. And I think we can safely apply it to the scriptures today. So verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect. We said perfect translates a Hebrew adjective, tamim, which in the book of Leviticus is used to describe the type of sacrifices, animal sacrifices, that Israelite is to bring to the temple. And those sacrifices were to be, among other things, what? Unblemished. Okay, without, remember in Malachi, the people were bringing animals that had broken legs and other serious physical defects. And the Lord says, you're not bringing me your best. And as a consequence, I'm not accepting your sacrifices. 
So the sacrifice had to be unblemished. It had to be an animal that was valuable to me because precisely because it was unblemished. So the law of the Lord is unblemished. It doesn't have errors in it. Well, isn't that isn't that helpful to us? I mean, do you rejoice that? I mean, what if we had a Bible that we sort of have, ooh, got to be careful, not so sure about that part, not so sure about that part. Yep. I mean, of course, a lot of people do read the Bible that way. They sort of have their favorite parts. And yeah, they, this is the word of God. And well, this is not because I don't like it. Because he goes. Yeah, Thomas Jefferson, right? You've seen his, his Bible, Jefferson's New Testament at Monticello, that he took his scissors because he was a, a deist or a naturalist. He took his scissors and he cut all the miracles out of the New Testament, especially cut the resurrection of Christ out of the New Testament, okay? Because Jefferson couldn't accept that the supernatural can happen, all right? So... Some like to pick and choose, but the, the law of the Lord is perfect. Okay, so this book is, and, and I know technically we say in the autographs, in the original manuscripts, we have enough manuscripts that our English translations today are exceptionally reliable. I mean, the things we argue about are at the level of, is the pool in John 5, named Bethesda or Beth Zapha. Was the man from, the de demonized man from Gerasa or Gadara? My faith doesn't depend on whether he was from Gerasa or Gadara or what the name of the pool was. And that, thankfully, through God's providence. I mean, it is an amazing providence that God has given us so many manuscripts of the New Testament and that the Jews transmitted, and this is what the um, Dead Sea Scrolls, by the way, have confirmed, the Jews were so faithful in transmitting the Old Testament. So you hold in your hands, when, when I say this is an inerrant Bible, I think we can say that with confidence, okay? So the law of the Lord is perfect, but then because it's perfect, look what it does. It revives the soul. Okay. So every time, think about it, every time you come to the reading of scripture, and I hope that there's a serious, sit down, concentrated time of scripture reading built into your life every day. Okay. A really good time is in the early morning, by the way. I don't, if you're at nighttime, it's fine. There's no law of God. But a good time is early in the morning because then what can you do? Yeah, you can think about it and apply it all day long. There's nothing better. So when I read the Bible, I read the Bible at night and in the morning. In the morning, I read the New Testament. At night, I read the Old Testament. And I pace myself so that I get through the Bible in about 11 months. It's maybe a little bit more, a week more than about 11 months. It's what it's averaged out the last 25 years or so. Um, but because I read the New Testament in the morning, I say, Holy Spirit, give me you know, one thing for my reading that you really want me to, to think about today. So this is just, this just a basic Bible reading. So this morning was Luke 17. And at the end of it, Jesus is talking about his second coming. He's, you know, and it's that passage. One will be taken, the other one left. One will be taken, the other one left. And I just, it, it caused me to pray, as I have many times, that Lord Jesus, help me to be ready for your second coming. When you appear, I want you to be pleased with what I'm doing. You know, I may be asleep <laughs> at the moment, but just in general, help me to be to live the kind of life by your grace that you would be pleased with. And I don't know about you, but that refreshes my soul. There are very few times, maybe when I'm just dead tired, uh, that I come to the scriptures and don't find some refreshment. It revives the soul. Does somebody have a testimony of that? Can you... Can you affirm that that's true in your own life? Mm-hmm. 
Okay? It revives our souls. Second, the testimony of the Lord is sure. Okay, so this is only a slightly different shade of meaning. It's perfect, it's without error, but because it is, it's a, it's a perfect guide. It's a perfect guide. I don't know if you've noticed, but GPS, at least I use Google Maps, is not always a perfect guide. For example, last Friday, I was to perform a wedding in Wisconsin, and uh, the road, uh, so the, the wedding venue was here, and the road was closed just beyond the entrance to the wedding venue. And Google Maps, because the road was closed, said I could not go to the place where I was trying to get to. <laughs> the, the church where I was a past senior pastor for many years, Google Maps, when it originally came out some years ago, actually had us where a, there's a giant landfill, <laughs> which might be suggestive. I don't know. <laughs> So Google Maps is not a sure guide in all cases. Often it is, okay. Uh, more often than not, it is. But it's not a sure guide in the way that the Bible is. The Bible is always, the Bible will never lead you astray. Have you thought about that? It'll never lead you astray. Never lead you on the wrong path. If, like me, you were born with a horrible sense of direction. Before GPS, somebody gave my family a tour of Europe and we rented a car and drove all over Europe. And not only did I get lost 3,611 times with my wife losing more and more patience with me. But so thankfully the car, we rented it in Germany that so had German plates because Enter the roundabout in Cambridge, England, and guess which way I go by instinct? Right. And to the right, <laughs> and everybody's coming the other way. And have you ever done this in England, in the roundabout? And I thought, the only solace I have is everybody's thinking, oh, that moronic German. <laughs> so rather than that, that stupid American. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. So uh, in any event, uh, the Bible will never lead us in the wrong direction. And then I love the next phrase. Because it doesn't, it makes wise the simple. It makes wise the simple. The, the uh, noun simple person is a, a little word called petit uh, in Hebrew. A petit, a simple person. It doesn't mean somebody who's dumb, it, it tends to be a person who's naive, who just doesn't know any better, because maybe he's not had any experience in this particular area of life. And the, the Bible makes that person wise. And the reason it does is because the Bible is clear. You know, in do, do you remember in Deuteronomy 6, what does the Lord say about his word, what are parents to do with his word in Deuteronomy 6? You should, you should, speak about them. you should speak about these things when you rise up and during the day and go to bed and specifically you should teach them to your children. Can you teach children the Bible? Can children understand the Bible as God gives them the help? Yes, they can, because the Bible is clear. Again, parts of it are more clear than others. Some passages are difficult. But in the overall sense, God has given us a clear book. The, uh, the textbook I use in the theology class I teach is by a professor named Wayne Grudem. And you say, why do you use a 1,600-page theology book in 11th grade? Isn't that a little sort of heavy lifting for 11th graders? 
And the reason it's not is Dr. Grudem, years ago, he was teaching theology and he thought, you know, the Bible is clear. Somebody needs to write a theology book that's clear. And the Lord, you know what, if you say so, somebody needs to, what's the next thing the Lord says? You. You do it. <laughs> okay. So whenever you say somebody needs to expect the Lord to answer, you're that somebody. So the Lord said, I want you to write a clear one. And this one is clear, so clear. It's not that it's simple or, or I, I mean, simplistic that's the it's not simplistic but it's clear and the bible is clear if you come to it again two preconditions one you're willing to be taught by it you have a teachable spirit as proverbs talks about numerous times right and you're willing to do what it says the bible will teach you even if you're simple, I'm really thankful because I'm, I think I'm a pretty simple person. Okay. And so the, the Bible is helpful to me. Let's continue. The precepts of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart. Again, these, these adjectives that David's using, there's only slight shades of difference in meaning. The precepts of the Lord are right. What does that mean? They're right. He said they're perfect. He said they're sure, but now he adds they're right. Without error. Okay, they're without error. Good. I think that's better than what I even thought. They fit the occasion. Okay, so the, the scriptures for whatever circumstances you find yourself in, there's at least general guidance from scripture. Often there's specific guidance from scripture and it fits the occasion. I've said before, it used to be until I think maybe even the 1980s, uh, the metric system was established or adopted first by the French during the French Revolution. And for years, for decades and decades, there was in the equivalent of the Bureau of Measurements and Standards in Paris, a meter rod. And this meter rod was a meter. And every other meter rod in the world had to be, had to conform to that meter. This is, what's a meter? This, <laughs> this is what a meter is, okay? So the Bible sort of like that. It's the standard. It's what is right. It fits the occasion. As a consequence, it rejoices the heart. Isn't that beautiful? When you see the Bible operate in your life, and you see as a consequence that your life begins to fall into place, that there comes to be an order in your life. I am not saying that everything is perfect, or that you don't suffer. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying even if you do suffer, there is an orderliness and things tend to fall into place, even in the midst of the very hardest of times. That's because the Bible is right. And you can rejoice as a consequence. Do you find yourself, um, I will tear up fairly frequently at reading the Bible. I read something that to me is so beautiful that the response of my soul is simply to tear up, not with sadness, but just with this sort of joy that this is true, that this is what reality is, okay? And there's a, there's a rejoicing. I have a book on my nightstand that I got about halfway through, say, six years ago, and I've never finished it, to my great discredit. But it's a, um, a series, it's a reflection on Psalm 119, which is also about the scriptures. And it's called, the title of it is Bible Delight. Bible Delight, okay? And, and there should be a rejoicing, there should be a delighting in the word of God. Uh, next, the commandment of the Lord, the word of the Lord is pure, 
enlightening the eyes. Okay, again, it's sort of like the others. You're not going to be led astray, but it's purely the word of God and nothing else. Some parts are harder than others. Some we struggle with, yes, but it is a pure word. Some of you remember when you were little, ivory soap was advertised as 99 and 94 one hundredths percent pure, which is why, and I still remember it distinctly when I was five years old, said a bad word, my mom washed my mouth out. But she used a hybrid soap. <laughs> I think she thought, well, this is so pure. This will clean up his mouth. <laughs> Maybe that was the strategy behind it. But I, I still use ivory soap today. Right? It's, but it's just because I've always used it, okay? <laughs> it's, it's, there's a supposedly a purity to it. Pure, I guess we should ask, it's 99 and 94, 100 percent pure but of what? <laughs> but the Bible is pure of truth. Therefore, it enlightens the eyes. Remember what Jesus said about the eyes, the eyes of the heart. Okay, if they're good, the whole body is healthy. If they're bad, the whole person is in trouble. But then look at the beginning of, the ver of verse nine. All of a sudden, a new phrase gets inserted. At the end of verse nine, the rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. That's sort of a summary statement of verses seven through nine. But look at the beginning of it. All of a sudden, it's not the word of the Lord, but the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Why do you think? So we're just, this is, this is just good Bible study, okay? Why did David, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in verses seven through eight, his focus is on the word of God. The word of God is X, therefore it does Y in my life. And now all of a sudden at the beginning of verse nine, the shift is to the fear of the Lord. Why? Why? That's what it just, we're compelled to ask as the Bible readers. This is, so when it says meditate on the word, ask yourself, why this shift? Because that just, from a purely literary standpoint, it doesn't fit. So it's got not to fit for a reason. What's the reason, do you think? Yeah. Good. Okay, so that, that's excellent. Very good. The fear of the Lord includes obedience to God's word. So that's one connection. If I don't fear the Lord, I'm not going to see the Bible as these ways that in these ways that David sees it. That's excellent. Okay, it's worship. You want to work that out a little bit? Good, good. It's all the fear of the Lord is is a big part of worship. Okay. And this rejoicing in God's word is part of worship. So it's all sort of one big category. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. The Lord can destroy, as Jesus said, the body and the soul in hell, so fear him. Mm -hmm. It gives us faith by keeping us from drifting. Okay. The fear of the Lord gives us staying power by keeping us from drifting. Okay. I'll add one more thing. All these are excellent. And it's really not very far from this one. It may, in fact, be just saying what you said just the opposite way is all. Okay. If if I bury my nose in and my mind in, Chandler, were you going to say something? Yeah, about the fear of the Lord. Go ahead. The best, uh, I feel it's the holiness of God. When I sin, I forget the holiness of God. That's why I sin. Yeah, okay. In the fear of the Lord, I think, you know, uh, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Exactly. The beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. Okay, so 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 
Knowledge and wisdom begin with the fear of the Lord. Where does the fear of the Lord begin? Ha! Okay. A sense of God's holiness. A sense of God's holiness. That's where the fear of the Lord begins. Okay. Here, I think the idea is, and again, I think it's just really saying what you said, just in the opposite way. The more you're in the word, what's going to develop within your soul? The more your mind, so, so uh, uh, the writer and pastor John Piper talks about a Bible-saturated mind, okay? A Bible-saturated mind. I um, It rained up in uh, Wisconsin at Lake Geneva early yesterday morning, and one of the students had left a bandana out in the yard, and when I picked it up, it's <laughs> saturated with that water, etc. Think about your brain being like that. Is your brain saturated with scripture? I've told you before, it was said of John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, that if you pricked him, he would bleed the Bible. When Jesus, think about Jesus on the cross, what was in Jesus's mind? Bible, right? Jesus is mine in Psalm 22, 1, okay? Um, and others uh, from the Psalms especially, all right, as he hung on the cross. So you know, how much does the, how much of my thoughts are Bible thoughts? Even if I can't say, well, this comes from this particular verse. It's just the Bible is so much so your uh, computer has an operating system, right? That was a, actually a question. <laughs> Chesdy, does a computer have an operating system? Yes. Thank you, Chesdy. And is that sort of the background to the whole operation of the, thank you, Chesdy. Okay, I thought I was right. Think about the Bible is more than that, obviously, but it's not less than that. Is the Bible sort of just in the background? And, and often, of course, it needs to be in the foreground. But is it at least in the background? In all of your thoughts? Is it your operating system, Kevin? Pastor Steve, just food for thought um, on this subject. I think it's so important. Is that uh, it's possible to have your head filled with scripture as the Pharisees. But I think I would say it even a little differently than to you. It's more important that your heart be filled with the word because obviously the Pharisees knew it cold and they completely like blew everything. They, you know, they knew the word better than anybody in their culture and they missed the whole ball. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, this is a, this is a, a terrific, terrific point. So, maybe it's better to say, is your heart saturated with scripture? Yeah. Then your mind saturated. Is your heart saturated? Because you can know a lot of Bible. And but Jesus, you know, then would challenge the Pharisees, don't you know the word? And they would say, Yeah, I know the word. No, you don't. <laughs> because you just know letters and phrases. You don't know the heart of it, the heart of God in it. And that takes the Holy Spirit. I would say that's a great evangelical mistake that we teach people head knowledge and we don't teach them how to know the word of God in their heart and they make these they do these crazy insane things, ministers, etc. It's a it's a terrible flaw. Yeah. And oh oh good Kevin because notice David connects the knowledge of scripture here with what? The fear of the Lord. That's a that's a hard thing, isn't it? I mean, that's the hard thing, is the fear of the Lord. And so David's jealous that people would not take this psalm and say, "Well, I just need to stuff my head with knowledge," the way you know you learn French or something. I just need to stuff my head with vocabulary and grammar and so forth. He's saying, "No, you need to know the word, but you need to know it so that the fear of the Lord will be produced in your heart." Thank you. That was worth the cost of admission. By the way, Dave, did you take a 10 from everybody when they came in? 
<laughs> Say Andy. <laughs> yes. When we are born again, we have one soul. So if we are filling our mind with the word of the Lord and it's supposed to attend, then we do not believe to eventually that that would actually sink our hearts. That is not our responsibility, but the Holy Spirit actually does that. Great, Sandy. Great. Because I teach my students both the knowledge of the Bible in general. But I, I'm trying to get to their hearts, but I can't reach my hand into their hearts. The Holy Spirit has to do that. And so that's right. The, the, it's the, the Holy Spirit lives in every believer. And as we take in the word, ask him to teach us. So Paul writes so famously in uh, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 12 through 14. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the Spirit, capital S, who is from God. Why? That we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this, the things freely given us by God, in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Meaning, the Holy Spirit will take this word as I read it, and he will, he will teach it to me. And he'll give me not just head knowledge of it, but he'll give me that heart experience of it and that heart knowledge of it. What was it about? Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 12 to 14. Mm -hmm. Georgia? You know, yeah, yeah. So it's Georgia just just adding the, what is that? It's obeying, as we said. God doesn't promise that we'll understand Scripture until we come to it, submissive to it, and willing to do what it says. When we are, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, as He teaches it. Then we find that what David experienced is true in our case. And because we've just got a couple of more minutes, Sandy, don't let me forget your hand before I close. Okay. All right. Notice what David says. You got it. We've at least got to get to verse 10. So, what because the Bible is all these things that David has described in verses seven through nine, what's true is more to be desired are they the rules of the Lord, the words of the Lord, more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. And some of you know that picture of the Bible as honey is used also in Psalm 119. Okay, so the Bible is valuable as the, the, you know, the English, the United Kingdom's monarchical installation coronation service says, it is valuable, but there's a sweetness to it. The longer I live, the more the Holy Spirit enables me to experience a sweetness in the Bible. That's not to say some of it is extremely convicting. And I want to just, okay, Lord, I'm so tired. I think I'll just. <laughs> the, I, the, I, spirit, I, I can't remember exactly the passage, but there's a passage that, and you know, you preach on repentance. And but this is what the Lord does. <laughs> then he tells you where you need to repent. You, you thought, okay, I'm preaching. I better get repented up. So I get repented up. And then. No sooner do you preach on repentance than the Lord shows you this. You thought you had gotten everything. You didn't. <laughs> There's more. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes you might say, Lord, I'm really tired. Let me just close this and I'll come back to it later. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. The Holy Spirit will, will even that is sweet. The conviction of the Lord is meant to be sweet. We may not experience it all that way, but that's the way uh, the Lord has it for us. And moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. 
And then David prays in verses 12 through 14. Uh, Let your word keep me from little the, the sins I don't realize I'm committing. And let your word keep me from the sins I do realize I'm committing. He says that in verses 12 through 13. And then very famously, a lot of you grew up in churches where the pastor would read the a passage he was going to preach on. And then he would pronounce these words, right? Okay. Uh, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, or you might say our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So as I think about your scriptures and as I speak your scriptures, let my words, let those meditations in my heart and then the words that I speak as a consequence be acceptable, be good in your sight. Okay, Sandy, I didn't forget. So actually, when I was growing up, I was like, you guys to church, learn all the scriptures, they didn't join me. And I became, and I actually turned my life over to them. At 29, those same scriptures became my like me. And I mm. so much. Mm. So mm. it's like, even if it's not going in and you still want me, you don't know what the Holy Spirit is going to do, but you need to be able that's right. So like in Awana where they memorize the verses, you always, oh, are they just memorize the verses to get the prize that they win? Okay. So you, what you do is you pray because the verses are there. Uh, I had somebody say to what, me one time, you know, the way memory works, do you realize when you memorize a passage of scripture, it becomes physically a part of you? interesting okay it becomes physically a part of you up here in this gray matter someplace in ways that we don't understand it becomes physically a part of you so so you you teach it and you may not see a response now but it's there it's there someplace and by god's grace the holy spirit may when you're 20 when the child reaches 29 may bring those back to memory and then they'll be sweet we just, we teach as the Lord leads, pray that it's not just head, that the Lord brings them down to the heart, but we may not live long enough to see him do that. Sandy? Uh, I remember when I'm going through some thoughts, you know, um, I have a hard time praying, but because I memorize the scripture, I memorize the scripture, I, I start uh, um, reciting the scriptures, and then the prayer comes in so it helps me, yeah. When, and that's a great point. And I tell people all the time, I don't know how to pray. Well, pray the Bible. You can be, you can be sure. I mean, you, you've got to be careful, obviously, that you don't pray the end of Psalm 137. <laughs> you know, for the Babylonians, let them dash your babies against the rock. I mean, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Lord dash their babies against them. I mean, that's a, a special circumstance. Okay. But but you um, you know, almost always you're on safe ground if you're just praying the words of scripture, especially if the Lord says, I do something, you can say, Lord, you say, you say, you know, I've heard people say you wrap the Lord up in his promises. Oh, I don't uh <laughs> No, I'm not going to dictate it, but Lord, you say in your word that you do this. And so I'm going to trust, because your word says it, that you will do this, this, you, this promise in my circumstance. I'm going to trust that because your word is true. Your word is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. Okay, we better close before the music starts. <laughs> Father, thank you for a um, really great discussion today. Thank you for this uh, reminder from Kevin and the table over here, Lord, and from others that it isn't just head knowledge. If it doesn't get down to the heart, God, uh, it's got to be heart knowledge. It really does. And so grant, as, uh, grant, Lord, that we would be uh, readers and doers of your word. We would be those who meditate on the law of the Lord both day and night that we would experience your blessing. And Holy Spirit, we ask you to do what 1 Corinthians 2, 12 to 14 says you do. You take the things of God and you teach us. Jesus said to the disciples, the Spirit will lead you into all truth. 
Well, Spirit, you live in our hearts because Christ has redeemed us. So lead us through the ever faithful word of God into all truth and let it be heart truth and not just head truth, God. Do these works for our immense good and effectiveness in this world and do them mostly for your glory, God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Great discussion. Appreciate it.